It is my honor to welcome Tom Emmerich, president of Emmerich Consulting. Tom has spent over 30 years managing benefits for major corporations, including Walmart stores, Burger King Corporation, and BP. Please welcome Tom. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I, most of my career I was managing benefit plans, like the introduction said. My last job was with Walmart stores running, running their benefit program. Uh, when I left there, we covered about a million lives in the U.S. I think they're up to about 1.3 million under medical now. But I actually won the easy, easiest benefit jobs in the country because everybody in the whole country was in one plan, from the part-timers to the CEO. When I was at British Petroleum, I ran 220 plans with 220 open enrollments, SVDs every year. The only problem with, with Walmart in the early days when we were doing printed open enrollment material, we'd have to go out in the spot paper market in March and try to find enough paper plus warehouses to store it and in contract with the different printers and railroad companies to transport all this stuff. But, so we had a logistics function. I'm delighted to be here today. What I'm going to be talking about today, uh, let me back up a slide. I am a president of Emmerich Consulting. I'm also a partner in Laura Strategies, a benefit consulting firm headquartered here in Chicago. So I have an office in Arkansas and have one on Monroe Street. What I'm gonna be talking about today we call it the 7% solution. Uh, I believe this is a significant evolution in population health cost management. Let me explain why. In benefit plans today, 7 to 10% of enrollees are spending 80% of the dollars. Most companies are spending 90% of their efforts managing the 90% of employees and members who are spending 20% of the dollars. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit in reversing that, that effort. And what I'm gonna do, be doing today is presenting how you can do that, solutions you can have for that, and what kind of a difference that it makes. Uh, this is not about deepest discounts, but it's gonna be about getting people the, the best quality of care for the Pareto Group. The Pareto Group is the group that spends 80% of the money. It's named after an Italian economist named Pareto who first defined the 80-20 rule. Um, it, for the folks in that group, in that outlier group, that Pareto group, they have very serious conditions. Many of them are seeing multiple specialists and they're being treated, given multiple prescriptions. And there is gross variation and how patients like that are handled from tertiary center to tertiary center. Many of them have tertiary, go to tertiary centers for care, and I'll say that again. There's extreme variation in how patients like that are handled, are handled and I'll show more about that. First off, everybody knows the situation we have in America. 14 years ago, the United States ranked fifth in life expectancy in the world, and we're declining rapidly compared to our peer countries as our per capita spend on health care laps our peer countries, their life expectancy is increasing relative to ours. I'll show more about that in a minute. Why? Obvious reasons, plus this, I'm coming back to this Pareto group, orphan Pareto groups. We have all kinds of programs for people with diabetes, smoke enders, but when somebody needs a transplant, you had them a net network directory and say, have at it. When somebody's facing having a ventricular assist device put in them, last one I saw was in somebody for four days and cost $800,000. There's, no, there's nobody out there to assist them. They and their families are completely on their own. There's also, again, for that Pareto group, that group of outliers, there's gross variation in quality, gross variation in net cost, and gross variation in the medical ethics under which they're handled, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Your Pareto group, I'm speaking to the employers and plans here, about 10% of the folks that are spending 80% of the dollars have been completely misdiagnosed. I'll give examples of that later. Another 10% have incomplete diagnoses. They may have a diagnosis that's correct, but they have other diagnoses that are being ignored. So as many as 20% of 
have a completely bad diagnosis or a suboptimal diagnosis. What's that mean? A huge impact on your dollar spend. Of the folks that are spending 80% of the bucks, 20% of them have bad diagnoses. It doesn't have to be that way and that cannot stand going forward. 35%, it's probably close to 40%, have bad treatment plans. If you're misdiagnosed, you're gonna have a bad treatment plan. So up to as many as 400% in certain categories of care, 100% of the people have bad, diagnose, have bad treatment plans. Over the course of my career back to the 80s, I'd pick out certain people in the companies that I worked for that had multiple complex conditions and I'd send them to a cer certain places. And I'll talk more about that in a minute too for a, a workups. Of the ones that I've sent, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds over the last, uh, last 20 years or so, 100% of them were given a new diagnosis and a completely revised treatment plan. So 40% of the people that are spending 80% of the bucks have bad treatment plans. You're wasting an enormous amount of money on your benefit plans. And it does not have to be that way. Excessive cabbages. Almost everybody in the world knows we do too many cabbages in America. Um, I don't know, did you see the Wall Street Journal article of the day? I printed a copy of it, it said, heart treatment overused. For 97% of the patients with stable angina, giving them a cabbage offers no advantage in terms of longevity or lifestyle period. We're doing those wholesalely in America today. There's no excuse for it. This is just the latest in a series of articles on, on the problem with that. As benefit managers and plan managers, you don't have to tolerate that. There's things that can be done to prevent that from happening. My job at Walmart, I ran benefit programs in a number of other countries, so I'm gonna give you some comparative data because people often say, well, this happens in the US because we're less healthy. Let's take a look at the facts. And I picked these four countries to compare the US to because they run their medical schools about the same way we do. In fact, doctors in many of those countries with the medical school in the US. So it's a good comparison. And I'm just gonna highlight the US versus the UK. We spend double what they do per capita on healthcare and twice as much of our GDP goes to healthcare in the US versus the UK. That's, that's column two, column three. Now in the US, we have 1% more heart attacks than they do, column five. We do 350% more invasive procedures and they survive heart attacks longer. I'm gonna repeat that, 1% more heart attacks. In the US, we do 350% more invasive procedures. There's just simply no excuse for it. People say, but we're less healthy. Let's look at the facts. We have 10% more obese people than they do, not 350% more, but 10% more. They have 6% more smokers. If you look at column eight, and they drink booze like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> In fact, I'm thinking about retiring to the UK someday. <laughs> and uh, so if I, in my early in my career, I worked for an insurance company and played around at being an actuary. So I, uh, if, if columns, uh, seven and eight, roughly I'll set column six. There's no reason to be that we're doing 350% more invasive procedures. I talked to a person who's had a card cardiothoracic surgery at a, for at a ho hospital chain recently. I asked the person, what percent of the heart surgeries being done in America do not advantage the patient either in terms of lifestyle or longevity? She said 60%. The question is, why are we paying for those? I talked to a, a doctor that was trained at Harvard in the US and runs a big clinic in, in Australia. He and I had a nice conversation about this. I said, what do the doctors in America do this? What do the Commonwealth doctors think about the doctors in the US that go at the medical school is that do this? They said, we're puzzled by it. We don't know why they do this. I said, it wouldn't work in Australia. The doctors would be ostracized over here, wouldn't be allowed to practice if they did that. Then he got this close to my face and he said, but the bigger question is, why in the US do you pay for it? 
inappropriate, unnecessary surgery would not be paid for in these other countries, period. The United States stands alone in the world in paying for doctors to do a bypass on somebody that can't possibly benefit from it. I talked to a guy that used to run a big major hospital chain. I was surprised that he told me this, but he said, yeah, we do, we do more heart procedures than we should, but how the hell else are we gonna support the emergency room and the maternity program? I like to slid out of my chair when he said that, because he's saying, we're get, yeah, we're getting people in, we're gonna take a skill saw, crack their chest open, jiggle some veins around in their heart, sew them back up, it may take them three months to recover. If you do it on an elderly person, they may never recover to support their maternity program. Unbelievable. Some people say it's defensive medicine. There are places that don't do that and they do not get sued any more than the ones that do it. That's a straw dog, it's a straw man, always has been, track the money. These doctors are making a fortune doing that. The question we have to ask ourselves is why are we paying for that? Why do we pay for them to do that? Part of this new proposition for moving forward, the innovation is we need a new wellness design in America. We need it badly. First, try to help members stay well. Stuart, Cindy and others, great, good job in making a presentation about that. We should do those things. But if we know anything today after 20 years of corporate health and wellness programs, no matter how much that you do, people are gonna get sick anyway. They may get sick a year later or something, but they're gonna get sick. And they're gonna have the same types of diseases. They're still gonna have heart attacks. They're still gonna have faulty mitral valves. They're still gonna get cancer. They're still going to have, a, have a, a joint disease. And they're gonna have major, uh, major surgery on those, in, in, in those fields. First off, the second leg of the new wellness model is, when illnesses do occur, help make sure the patient has the right diagnosis. I mean, if we're running benefit programs and we're letting 20 or 30% of the bucks being spent for people that have the wrong diagnosis, we can't look ourselves in the mirror and say we have a wellness program. There are excellent tools today to verify diagnoses in an excellent way on major populations. We need not only to do those things, but on the back end, we need to catch them and make sure they don't have the bad procedure. Third, when one of these folks in the Pareto group, again, complicated conditions needing tertiary quaternary care, when they have to have, when they have to have an operation, make sure they get to a facility that gives the best quality care with the highest outcomes in the most ethical setting. By ethical, I mean they don't do surgeries on people that don't need them, period. That represents about 5% of the care being delivered in America today. Bad example, here's a cardiologist in New Jersey that charged $59,000 for a heart ultrasound. Doesn't allow 74. Anybody see this article? Wall Street Journal, March 29. Somebody finally got their hands on a chunk of the Medicare database and found a doctor, Vishal James Mucker, who had a small number of patients. He was doing multiple spinal effusions on a small number of Medicare patients. I think he had about 20 of them done about six surgeries on each one. And like, like the Reading Hospital, the other doctors didn't turn him in. The hospital didn't turn him in. The patients got wind of it. When you talk about a major breakdown in the healthcare system, when this is going on at hospitals and the hospital has no, doesn't stop it, why don't they stop it? They'll say it's not their job. Besides that, they make a lot of money off these types of patients. The other hospitals don't stop, the other doctors don't stop it. It's, both these cases were stopped by patients that observed this going on. Back in Redding, California, by the way, Everybody in town knew that was going on. They, they used to joke in town, don't have a fender bender in front of this hospital because you're going to get a cabbage. Go, that's a great book on that. You ought to read it. 